and Computing and Director of the Salsa Lab. Uh, and with no further ado, I will uh, turn the podium over to Dr. Fox to interview, to introduce our first speaker. Well, thank you, thank you very much, everybody, for attending in uh, these remote sessions. And uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this Big Data class. Uh, this is the first time we've offered this class, so um, we, will, we would like your feedback. Uh, and uh, we apologize if we don't get everything uh, right the first time. Uh, we have a rich set of, um, of uh, activities. and. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to say that the first talk will be given by Alex Soleil of John Hopkins University, who is perhaps the leader in what I would call data-intensive cyber infrastructure, the use of uh, large-scale uh, systems to analyze um, scientific and engineering data. In his case, he um, focuses his home field as astronomer, but he has made many contributions in other areas, in particular sensor networks. And uh, without uh, further ado, I should also say Alex is a professor in computer science and astronomy, so he is uh, very interdisciplinary. And I would like to ask him to start this uh, kickoff keynote, uh, which I'm very pleased to offer to the virtual school. Thank you. Alex, are you ready to go? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much for the invitation to open this school. And <coughs> so I would like to talk today about the extreme data intensive computing and so we live today in an exponential world where the data is doubling every year and it's not only just the scientific data and it's interesting to think about where does this data come from at least in the sciences and I built this chart about 10 years ago <coughs> which shows the world's largest telescopes that's the blue line on a logarithmic scale over a 30-year time span, how the collecting area, so the total aggregate area of the glass associated with the world's largest telescopes has grown, and that's roughly a factor of 30. And the green line shows the number of pixels, CCD pixels, on these large telescopes, and that has grown during this 30-year period by a factor of 1,000. And in 2000, there were about, uh, if we added up all the pixels in all the mosaic cameras in the world uh, on telescopes, it was about 1 billion pixels. Today, we have several cameras which are 1.4 gigapixels or larger, and the LSST camera will be just by itself 3 gigapixels. So when we build a new camera, for an existing telescope, we don't build a new telescope. We just basically throw away the old camera and replace it. And that the generations of superconducting technologies are build, enabling us to build smaller and smaller devices, and uh, therefore bigger and bigger cameras, <coughs> then uh, this is the exponential process. So basically more slow is giving us this exponential process that enables us to generate these new instruments. <clears throat> but what we haven't realized at the time when we started to replace the photographic plates in astronomy with these detectors, that how this will change the nature also how we do computing on the astronomical data. And so more and more we have to deal with the, increase the, the data avalanche that is coming off of these detectors. And this is of course not only happening in astronomy, the same mosaic cameras you can find also in the gene chip or the, in, in the high super sequencers, which are observing basically the gene chips instead of the sky, or in the remote sensing where the satellites have similar cameras observing the Earth. And as the data is increasing at an exponential rate, as it is doubling, it's increasingly harder to extract knowledge. The number of scientific papers is certainly not doubling every year. It's probably growing still also exponentially, but only at around the 10 percent uh, exponentiation rate per year. And this is also occurring. In, the same trend can be observed also in commerce. So, when we look at the world's uh, largest companies, the, each of them are building huge data centers. At this point, uh, about 20 percent of the servers in the world are bought by five companies. When I typed in data center into Google Images, this is the image I got. So basically, it's this 
data centers are also requiring increasingly large amounts of power. So when we collect data, we have to realize that it, they, we collect data on all scales. So it is not just the very largest, so the, the petabytes and exabytes that we have to worry about. These exabytes are made out of sometimes very small data sets, sometimes of web pages, and if we just focus on science, a lot of the data that is actually quite small, that is coming off also, that is in Excel spreadsheets, and and this whole, the, the distribution of data as a function of size is a power law, and as the data is growing on the high end, so the largest data sets are becoming larger, the complexity grows as well, we are generating the same, at the same rate, more and more and more small data sets. And most of these data sets today are collected by electronic sensors in the lab. Most of the lab instruments are already directly connected to computers, so they are writing the data directly into a spreadsheet or a flat file. So how can we do the scientific data analysis? In this world, when, as we generate data at such an exponential rate, data is everywhere, and it will never be at a single location. It will be very often or mostly tied to the location of the experiment. So the CERN LHC experiment has just started, and it is generating many petabytes per year, and this, this so-called tier zero data center is located in Geneva, and then smaller subsets of the data are pushed out to tier one and tier two and tier three centers. And they are hierarchically replicated. What are the computer architectures today? So compared to the IBM mainframes in the 60s, so today's computers are increasingly CPU heavy. So we have built very large arrays of uh, CPUs connected to the substantial amount of memory, but the memory is already quite local. And then these are connected with networks where the interconnectivity is getting slower. And then these are in turn connected to the IO subsystems, the disk drives. So as we look at the function of time, the CPUs have been running ahead by far compared to the IO rates of this subsystem. Of this, of this computer. So th today's architectures are increasing the CPU heavy and IO poor. And th on the other hand, the computing, the, the computational challenges that we face are becoming increasingly data heavy. And so we need different architectures. And of course, it doesn't mean that these today's architectures, which are manifested in the largest supercomputers of the world, are, uh, are wrong. There are certain sets of problems which only those architectures can solve. But uh, what the, our computational challenges today are emerging over a much broader spectrum. So we also need to consider architectures which are capable of processing huge amounts of data. And this is the world in which the cloud computing paradigm is, is kind of, uh, coming in. And it is supposed to help in co-locating the data with the computing. But this is also not enough just to throw hardware and architecture at it. We need to think about new algorithms. When we have so much data that we cannot conceivably look at every bit of the data, we need to think about also incremental algorithms. where we look at the data, we, we pull out random pieces of the data, randomly sample the data, and try to create an inference and an estimation of the uncertainty, the so-called UQ, the uncertainty quantification. And basically, we do the computation. So we try to get the best statistical results what that we can get in one minute, in one hour, or one day, or in one week. How do we do today most of the data analysis? <coughs> and when we look at it, <coughs> it is not done at the supercomputer centers there we do the simulation. It is not done in the cloud because the really large scientific data sets, we simply cannot copy them into the cloud today. So most of the data analysis is done at the universities or at the national laboratories, but in mid-sized or small to mid-sized variable clusters. And many of these are simply bought from faculty startups and run in the Bloom Club. 
and as a result, the universities, if they have not yet, very soon they are going to hit the power wall. That the individual buildings are running out of power and electricity, so that we cannot double the data centers in the universities if the, as the data is doubling at the current rate. So this world is not scalable and not maintainable. And it's worth thinking about that how could we do things differently in the next, over the next five years so that we can actually survive and do our science. <coughs> so Jim Gray was a special, very special person. So I had the privilege to work with him for over 10 years. And Jim approached the scientific data challenge in a very systematic way. And he kind of formulated a bunch of rules of thumb. And the first of those was that he really codified that scientific computing is increasingly revolving around data, either generating large amounts of data or analyzing it. We need a scale-out solution for the analysis, so that in the long run, the only economically feasible way is to use commodity, very cheap commodity components to build out and scale out a system of the required scale. Well, as the networking speeds are falling farther and farther behind both the data rates and the CPU speeds, it is increasingly clear that we do need to move the analysis to the data rather than moving the data where the computing is. And he said this way, way before the cloud computing paradigm emerged. So he really has foreseen all these all this, uh, scenarios that we experience today. <coughs> now, the wonderful way of a heuristic way to establish an efficient communication between the astronomers or domain scientists and the database people, <coughs> He suggested that we should start the dialogue with, with the scientists giving 20 queries. And it seems like such a trivial thing, but it isn't. And when I first met him, he asked me to give my 20 queries about astronomy. And it forced me really hard to prioritize what are the most important questions that I wanted to ask from our data set. And many scientists, when you ask them, that what would you like to do with your data? They would say anything and everything. And it, and it is really not true. And it, it requires this, after they have gone through the 20 queries exercise, they realize that there are some things, a small number of things that are really important. And beyond that, it would be nice to try a lot of different things. But if we cannot do the five or 10 or 20 most important things, then essentially the whole experiment is a failure. And his last, uh, law <coughs> was to go from working to working, which means that we live today in a world when <coughs> a lot of the distributed computing is driven by commerce and commercial interest. And so the whole paradigm has undergone dramatic changes. Every two or three years, we enter the new computational, a new way of doing distributed computation. So we have gone from CORBA to the computational bridge, then to web services, and today we are in cloud computing, just over a 10 year period. And, and in this world, if we set out to build a very large uh, top-down application, by the time we finish with the design and the <coughs> and, and building the application itself, then essentially the outside world has completely changed and we, we have to start over again. <coughs> so Jim's paradigm was that in this world we have to build things that are capable to go from working to working. They are built of little atomic elements little modules that essentially as the outside world and the computational frameworks change, we have to change certain modules and certain layers, but the scientists don't have to throw away basically every two years what they have built up. So all they took is that they have spent many years to learn. And so this new world, the data intensive scientific computing, and its impact on science is now called the fourth paradigm of science. So what are the fourth paradigms? A thousand years ago, science